because it was colonial America, all of a sudden we have to be on the side of the British. <laughs> and, and because the, the war of independence is so strong here, there's always been a little discomfort with that, that, you know, George Washington was fighting for the British. Hello and welcome to the Aspects of History podcast. My name is Oliver Webb Carter and I'm the editor and your host. My guest this week is John Sales, writer and director of 18 films, twice Oscar nominated and the author of a new epic novel, Jamie McGillivray, which starts in Scotland and the Battle of Culloden in 1746 and then moves to America during the French and Indian War, which is known in Europe as the Seven Years' War. Now, the Seven Years' War, which was between a number of empires and states, but for the purposes of simplicity in this pod, it was France v Britain, was described by Winston Churchill as the First World War. It really was a global conflict, stretching from America, the West Indies, to West Africa and India. It began in 1756 and ended in 1763 with the Treaty of Paris and British supremacy in America and India. Within only 12 years, though, the 13 colonies of America had embarked on the War of Independence, and we all know how that ended. The French and Indian War describes the American theatre, and in John's novel, we follow his two heroes, Jamie and Jenny, as they side, disappointingly, with the French. Well, you can't blame them, they have a hell of a time at the hands of the British, or more to the point, the English. Jamie becomes a valued member of the Lenape tribe. Now, I'm fascinated by Native American culture, and so John discusses their involvement in the war and the importance of language. Of course, the story begins in Scotland and features many real-life figures, such as George Washington and Lord Lovett, the old fox, who was a prominent member of the Jacobite Rebellion. So we talk about that conflict, the origins of the novel, and there's a famous actor mentioned. We talk about John's filmmaking. Regular listeners may have heard me mention one of his films in our Film Club episode, Lone Star, which is a fabulous neo-western starring Chris Cooper and Matthew McConaughey. Many of John's films have a historical theme, so it's obviously a subject he's fascinated by. Anyway, that's enough from me. If you like this episode, please do subscribe and rate and review if you can. And do tell your friends. I'm always keen to have more people join in the fun. Coming up, I've got Anthony Selden talking about World War I and walking the Western Front, and James Rom on successes of Alexander the Great. So please do join me for that. In the meantime, I'll hand you over to me talking to John Sales. John Sales, welcome. This is a huge pleasure for me to talk to you. The great John Sales, filmmaker and and a novelist. So thank you very much for joining me. Nice um, to be here. Great. I wanted to start because having read this epic tale that goes from Scotland to it's 18th century Scotland in the middle of a you know what was effectively a civil war, all the way mm -hmm. to another conflict on the on much of the eastern seaboard of america where there's this america that is still being formed it's the incredible story but i i wondered is this something you've always wanted to write about the early days of america you know it's something it... uh, what happens with american history is what i was fed in the 50s um, when i was growing up starts you off kind of with the legend and then as you get older, you start to hear other things that may not jive with what you were originally told. And that has always interested me. You know, the difference between the official story, the, the legend that the country wants to tell about itself, and what actually happened, the complexity of what actually happened. So in the United States, we call what in Europe is called the Seven Years' War, the French and Indian War, because French people were involved and Indians were involved. And but it's it's you know it's very because it was colonial America. All of a sudden, we have to be on the side of the British, <laughs> and and because the the War of Independence is so strong here, there's always been a little discomfort with that. That you know George Washington was fighting for the British, so I had that background, and then I think it's over twenty years now. Robert Carlyle, the, the Scots actor, called me up. I think he was making a movie in Hawaii and somebody had suggested me for this idea he had. And he just had a, a, an idea about a Highlander who was defeated at the Battle of Culloden 
And instead of hanging him, they transported him to the New World, and he got involved with the Sioux Indians. And I said, well, if he lives to be 200, he'll get involved with the Sioux Indians. But there's plenty of Indians that were encountered on the East Coast. And I just liked the idea so much. I, I, on spec, wrote a screenplay for Robert to be in. And we came over to to Scotland and we toured the Highlands. And uh, we scouted in Georgia and Florida for those locations. We scouted in Canada and just were never, it was kind of an epic movie, still, you know, a two hour story, but an epic movie. We never were able to raise the money for it. And so some 20 years later, I just felt like, you know, I'm, I still love that story. And I went back into it. And what happens when you do that with a, with a screenplay, of course, is it starts to expand. And so the character of Jenny, who in the screenplay was maybe on seven pages, who just kind of appeared and reappeared once more, she becomes like a third of the book. When I discovered this thing that there were some women who were transported and one of the boats was actually taken by a French privateer and all the, you know, transported for the term of their natural life prisoners freed in Martinique. And I just thought of this starving barefoot clocking girl all of a sudden in Martinique and there's mangoes and good food and this totally different culture and a new language. And she's one of those people who is absolutely uneducated, but adventurous and really smart. Well, that's incredible that it all sparked off from Robert Carlyle. I, yeah. The, the, well, Culloden is is an extraordinary battle, actually, because of the savagery, really, in the yeah. in, in the in the aftermath, where I guess it was a Highland culture that was just destroyed. And and obviously, whilst reading it, I got the when you're reading about Native Americans, and you know that's what's coming as well. Mm-hmm. It's, it's it's well it's, yeah some some of what i was trying to get at in the book is that we grew up in the states and our history was most well civilized people came over to this country and encountered savages and mostly in the movies that i saw when i was a kid it, it seemed like all they did was dance around the fire at night and then go scalp white people their cultures were not represented in any way. And one of the things that I I learned over the years as I got interested in it is that the native cultures, especially in the East Coast at that time, were highly evolved. There was the what we call the Iroquois Confederacy, which was five and eventually, I think, six or seven tribes that came together to kind of rule their area. Very complicated diplomatic politics with other tribes around them. Very complicated economy, because all of a sudden there were these goods that they could have, the kind of rifles instead of bows and arrows and steel pots instead of having to make six pots out of clay every year. And they wanted that stuff and they got hooked on that, those consumer goods. And so all of a sudden they had to kill a lot more deer than they used to, to just eat and wear. And all of a sudden they're in their enemy's territory, poaching their deer and their enemies are in their territory poaching their deer. And then there's a whole beaver thing where beaver hats get popular in Europe. And and so all the beavers disappear and they're killing each other over beavers. So it was just as complicated as the Austrian secession, which you hear about in the book. You've mentioned that. And Uh um, Jamie, the hero, describes the war of Austrian succession so beautifully. It's a (laughs) brilliant summation. Yeah. And and, and when you try to, to... to parse it, you realize, oh my God, what a mess. Of course, they're killing each other all the time. And then as I kind of learned about bloody law in, in the Britain of that time, in the three kingdoms, I realized, well, who are the savages here? You know, they're, they're still, you know, hanging people until they're not quite dead and then eviscerating them and throwing their entrails on a fire so the dying person can see their entrails. And before they cut their head up and put it on a spike. So one of the one of the things I was going for is this idea of what exactly is savagery? What exactly? And then the interesting thing with the Highlanders is that the clan system has a lot of parallels with some of the 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 more the the less evolved politically tribes in the United States at the time. So there's something familiar there for Jamie once he gets there and starts to and then I, what I always had it was this idea that one of the modes of survival 
if you if you were a linguist, if you were good at languages, you were valuable, and and you might be able to survive by your wits and also by becoming valuable. Of well, I can speak French and English, and now I can speak Lenny Lenape, and they're you know those those treaties between the natives in America and Europeans. Very often there were six languages or so being spoken because nobody spoke one-to-one language. And, and of course, things get distorted. And in particular that's with really George important Washington. about land yeah. and life and, you know, war and tribute and stuff like that. So everybody wanted to, especially the Indians, wanted to really understand what we're making our mark on. But they might have to go through Mohawk to Lenny Lenape to German to Dutch to English to French. Yeah, and Chinese whispers. You end up not yeah. knowing the language. To learn a language, to learn a Native American language, must be. I come from a country where we're not known for our uh, knowledge of languages. Sadly, mm-hmm. nowadays, or pronunciation of them. Once you do learn them, <laughs> right? Exactly. <It's> <laughs> yeah. yeah, but I mean, it's, it's great that there's you know there's um, Ga- uh, S Gaelic in there as well. Yeah. Um, th- and so, and quite a bit of French. He also because he 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 started to be educated in law in in edinburgh he'd have some latin you know so he's somebody who's good at that and but i i don't i don't put you know dates in in the book on purpose he's with the indians for six or seven years before he even starts rising above surf status and he's just listening all the time and starting to understand and eventually uh shingas and his wife cloud woman the the chief and his wife realized we better not talk about him in front of him. I think he understands what we're saying. You know, the dog has learned our language. And he's with the Lenape. Is that a, a tribe that that evolved into, because they were shoved out West as a result? Of they, the there are no living Lenape speakers left. They were known as the Delaware Indians by the English. The French would have their words for them. They called them one thing. The, the British called them, because Lord Delaware owned some of the land that they were on. Tammany, who's the Indian who, in our legends, sold Manhattan Island to the Dutch, he was a Lenny Lenape. So they were all the way to Manhattan and then got pushed into Pennsylvania and then got pushed into Ohio. Eventually, they were split up into various groups in Indian territory, which is now the the state of Oklahoma. And by that time, they had intermarried with so many other tribes that there weren't too many. There there may still be an incorporated Lenny Lenape tribe, but they're probably mostly by blood quantum, as they say. They're probably two or three different, you know, kind of tribes and maybe some white people mixed in. Do, do you think it was inevitable, you know, once Europeans arrived, the, the nature? Yeah, I think if you think of Europe at the time, there was not a lot of places to go that weren't already spoken for. You know, the feudal system in, in most countries had left these lords and you you worked on their land and there was no way you could ever get that land. You couldn't even buy it, you know, until much later. So you had a lot of people who, you know, our story was usually, oh, for religious freedom, people came. An awful lot of people came because they they thought, well, it's got to be better than this. And there's all that land there and there's nothing but wilderness and savages on it and I could cut down trees and eventually I can kill savages and then it will be mine. The idea of owning your own land for for most of these people, you know, so so that flood from all those European countries, eventually, you know, so many of the tribes have this story about somebody being put on a boat and taken back, you know, willingly, and their job is to come back and report and say, how many of them are there? And then they come back and they say, look around you, you see these trees? Well, you know how many trees there are from here to the river? There are more of them than that. And these would be tribes that might have 5,000 people at the most. So so I'm afraid, you know, and I'm sure it happened on other continents, there have been those kind of movements that were inevitable. There were just too many people too hungry for land and who had superior technology if not superior morals or government. And uh, once they started coming and the word got out and it, and it was incremental and the, and the British tried 
to say, okay, here's the line, because they wanted to keep the trade going. And the companies that were making the trade, which were often royal companies, um, didn't, didn't want these poor settlers to mess up their trade. So they would say, here's the line, don't go beyond the line. And people kept going beyond the line and then complaining, why aren't you protecting us? And then eventually it was, oh, well, you know, there's some good furs over there. Or, you know, there's something else that, you know, there's some good wood over there that we can use for masts for our ship. Maybe we will move the line a little bit. So I, I think it was inevitable. The tribes themselves, in the novel certainly, very welcoming to those that, I guess I say welcoming, I mean, Jamie's brought into the tribe, Not he's not exactly a willing recruit, but he's running from a particularly nasty, well, he's effectively a slave, isn't he? Yeah. He's he's considered, you know, war booty. So there was there was some you usually killed your enemies, uh, especially if they were warriors, if they were younger. Very often there was this feeling like if we get somebody young enough, a kid, they're going to realize really quickly that our way of life is superior to what they had before. They're lucky kids. And we have lost some children. We have lost some people. Very often they were given the name of, of somebody in the family they had lost and they were raised as so that they had no idea of racial inferiority. They, they, you know, and, and as I do, I feel like, you know, race is an illusion and culture is real. And they really believe yeah. once they're in our culture and we raise them up, they'll be Lenape. Um, so I, we have a friend who's a Mohawk and, you know, part of his heritage is two boys who were kidnapped from Deerfield, Massachusetts in the 1600s, you know, but their bloodline continues within the, in the Mohawk and they were considered Mohawk Indians. It's complicated because the, the Americans and the, you know, colonists did not have that in their head. They, they had race very strongly in their head and they were already importing, you know, the Dutch and the, and the English were already importing slaves. And in order to feel good about that, they had to make that racial divide and say, well, that's not quite human. And one thing that is different between the British and the the French and the Spanish colonists, the British were a lot less likely, even if they fathered children with, with Indian people, with Native people, they were a lot less likely to bring them into the family, whereas the French often would. And so you get these these traders who are kind of half French, like Chartier. And eventually, one of the things that got me attracted to this is by the 1800s, the head of the Cherokee tribe was a Ross who looked whiter than you or me. He was probably one eighth Cherokee. The head of the Creeks was a McGillivray. And there was a McDonald who was the head of another one. And they were the sons of Scots traders who said, well, it makes sense for me to marry the chief's daughter. And then their sons would become, because they could liaise well and had some English or very good English, liaise with these Europeans who you just had to deal with if you're going to survive. And so pretty soon you had all these you know, chiefs of, of Eastern tribes with Scots names. It's, it's such a, a rich part of American history, is it? Yeah. Is it widely known in, in America? I don't think so. I, I, I think the, it's getting a little bit more known. Uh, there was a very good book in the late 60s called Bury My Heart at Wounded, Wounded Knee. Yeah, very familiar. And I did not take history courses when I, I got to go to college. And it's one of the things that got me interested in history, because as I each chapter was another story from that encounter between the, the the Europeans and the different native tribes moving across the country, moving from east to west. And as I read the the chapters, I kept saying, I've seen that movie. <laughs> you know, that was Burt Lancaster playing in it, or, or Charles Bronson playing an Indian or Anthony Quinn playing an Indian. And more importantly, this is a better story than they had in the movie. This is a more complex, but also it's just a better story. And so as I got into it, and I learned a lot as I was doing research, you know, both about what was going on in Scotland and the, you know, and and in in London at the time, and the, you know, as you know, um, Lord Lovett was the last Lord executed, you know, um, but the the bloody law kept going for quite a while. I just, it, it just filled out. And that's why the book is 800 pages. 
Did you watch the Peter Watkins film on Culloden? Have you seen that? Yes, years and years ago. I wa- I've watched it a couple times. And it had that, there was a, a show in the 50s called You Are There, which they did that similar thing of interviewing things. And what struck me about it is he got the part of it that was, you know, there were there were diehard people who really believed in the cause. There were a lot of other people who just, well, the Laird says, I got to go, I got to go. And and if I don't go, I'm not going to have any land to till when I come back. It it was not. I think the majority of the Jacobites who fought were not Catholic. So it wasn't you know, the religion wasn't the only thing. It, a lot of it was we're Scots. What are we? We're occupied. We want to get these people out. But there were an awful lot of people in that battle who had no idea what they were doing or why they were there, really. And I think that, you know, in in the case of the British Army, there were a lot of poor people who rather would rather not have been there, but that was the, that was the job they could get. And, you know, so I actually, I actually ended up reading a lot of Kipling for the the British side of it to, to get a feel for that, that life. And a a lot of books about the life of a a red coat soldier in that time. And like today, that's a culture. The army is a culture and that army had its own culture, just like those Indian tribes of, there would be a warrior sect within the culture and they would have, you know, rituals like the, the British soldiers did if they do each other's cues and, you know, do each other's buttons and, you know, have a certain kind of camaraderie, even though it was so class oriented that if you were on the bottom, you were on the bottom. Yeah, difficult to rise. Uh, yeah. What did you find reading Kipling in, in sort of today's world? Because it's quite unfashionable nowadays. I think it's fascinating. You know, I, I, I had read it before for my other big novel, uh, A Moment in the Sun, because at, at one point there's a Chinese woman who ends up being the mistress of a British guy, and he makes her learn these Kipling poems. And be, because the, the book is about the Philippine-American War, and one of Kipling's famous poems here was The White Man's Burden. And the the subtitle of it is America in the Philippines. And he's basically saying, we've done the good thing for white Christians. We've, you know, spread civilization. Now it's your turn. So you can't just leave these poor people in their darkness. You have to kill them and take over the country. I think, you know, whether you whether you like the person or want to want to hang out with them, I I think you just can't ignore that. This that was the coin of the realm. And he was a major person as far as the way, you know, white people in Britain saw the world. And and he 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 was there, you know, he talked to those soldiers. So I think he probably has a pretty good idea and a little bit exaggerated of what that barracks life was was like. Absolutely. When he when he puts in a number of his poems, when he puts himself in the mind of a, a British soldier. Yeah. I mean, I can tell because there's obviously many moments in the in the novel when you have your men from the ranks, you've put yourself in their minds. And, and it's just it ca- it seemed to capture quite well throughout. You know, there's this there's squaddies throughout who are sent to do yeah. a pretty. And it, it goes job. through the through the ages. You know, the, there was great cartoon during World War Two drawn by Bill Malden of these Willie and Joe. And they were these two dog faces who never shaved. And they're funny. You know, because it's that gallows humor. They they never get to wash. You know, they're always in ruins that they helped create. And there's this kind of, and the officers are, they're never going to get to be officers. You know, they, they don't even want to make sergeant because they don't want the responsibility. But there's this, to, to stay alive and stay human, there's this constant humor. You know, guys I know who were in Vietnam said the same thing. Is, is there something, you know, you made these grim jokes all the time. And there was a certain character that I thought Kipling really, you know, captured in those short stories of his. There are a number of uh, quite significant historical figures, but George Washington (laughs) in the novel makes an appearance. I mean, he kicks the whole bloody war off. He was very ambitious, both, both as wanting to become a very wealthy squire in Virginia. And, you know, these colonies each had their own kind of personality at that time. So the, the idea that they ever came together, you know, because they, they had already kind of evolved apart. The Georgia colony started as a penal colony. You know, the often they, you know, this, this colony is Episcopal. This one lets you be whatever you want. This one's Anglican or whatever. 
he was also militarily, you know, very ambitious. And so he wants to shine and, and, you know, not knowing that he's going to lead a revolution against the British, he wants them to, to think he's the guy they should go through. And he's, he was a surveyor. He, he and this, this friend Christopher Gist were always surveying because they were looking to acquire land. So when the Indians encounter him, and there's a very good book that came out just before I started writing that was very, very useful about his, the length of his career and his interactions with Indians. And, and he had the, okay, I'm going to have to deal with him diplomatically, but that doesn't mean I have to tell them the truth. You know, uh, you know this idea of I'm a little superior and I can trick them. So I'm going, only going to tell them what I think they need to know to do what I want to do. And he runs into this Todd Morrison, you know, who is also a politician. He happens to be an Iroquois politician and he's got his own agenda. And that's pretty much what happened to when they killed the, the Jumonville is he, he was being played when he thought he was playing the Indians. And this guy who just hated the French took the opportunity and said, well, I'm going to get these white people killing each other. And if he's going to just take prisoners and they're going to do this crazy European thing of trading prisoners and being honorable and, oh, you know, you, you, you have the run of the fort, even though you're a prisoner because you're a gentleman, you know, um, we'll even loan you some money so you can buy some things from the commissary. That was just not native way. And so he just goes up and he, he sunk a hatchet in this guy's head. And then all of a sudden, George Washington took him a while to recover from that, you know, because it's like you, that was not your orders. But both countries were, they were, they'd been at peace for a while, France and England, and they were, a proxy war was not something that they, they thought they would lose. The French, unfortunately, were just so corrupt already in, in New, New France that they had no, those poor soldiers had no chance. And the British really put a lot of resources in. Their bank account was a little better. So they survived those colonial adventures. Uh, oh, that's something I hadn't appreciated, actually. What the, the French administration was, was what, corrupted completely, was it? The the guy who was really in charge of it was really, he was kind of like the, the purser. He, you know, set the prices and stuff like his name was Bigot. And because it was a time of this lavish overspending and and display at the French court, he decided, well, you know, Quebec is going to have the same thing and I'm going to be the center of it. And the political head kind of went along with it because he wanted to feel like he was one of those guys. So the the British soldiers got most of what was sent for them to eat and wear. Bigot was skimming so much of what was supposed to go out to these poor French soldiers in these forts that when they encountered the British, very often they just they just did a show and then they surrendered as soon as they could. Then they brought a couple better generals over Montcalm and a couple other people who knew what they were doing, who kind of whipped some of them into shape. But really, the French, they kind of lost heart. And there were a lot of people in back in France who said, we're losing money on this proposition. They call it the icebox. You know, they celebrated when they surrendered. You know, there were people in Paris who said, finally, we're not going to lose money year after year in this thing that's just not bring. It's only making a few people rich and it's not doing the country any good. There's that section with Jenny in the east coast of Canada mm-hmm. um, that, that encapsulates that uh, really well. The vision of uh, or the view of the seven year I keep on calling it the seven years war. It's just mm-hmm. I studied it at A level. So yeah, it's in yeah. my in my head is that. But the French Indian War. Is that something then, because it's it's a very short time before the uh, War of Independence mm-hmm. and obviously involves a key participant, George Washington. But looking at George Washington's role in the Seven Years' War, we obviously know what he became. But oh. at the time he was, um, you know, there was the incident that you've described. And then when he's captured as well, or rather, you know, he has to surrender his, his little fort and, and, and is later involved in a, in a military disaster. It's amazing to think he'd sort of uh, recovered to become the commander of the Continental Forces in the in, you know, after such well, a disastrous beginning to his career. Yeah. When, when the American Revolution started, there weren't that many experienced soldiers, you know, who had been in big 
combat, who had had cannon, who had had, you know, cavalry to play with and things like that. He was one of the few. Uh, there was an old Dutch guy who in one in some of the early battles named Herkimer, and he happened to have fought in some of the European wars. And so they said, you're a general. He said, OK, you know, I know what a cannon is and let's go find one, you know, um, you know, steal one from the, the British and fight them. So it, it was kind of just like, OK, you're on our side. First of all, you've decided you've done well enough here that you think it's a good idea to just say to the British, go away. Um, we're fine here. We don't need you anymore. In fact, you're you're you're, you're being really annoying, you know, taxing us like crazy. And we could do a, a lot better without you. And you don't really understand us anymore, uh, which was true. Hmm. Um, and as I said, he was very ambitious, but also he had a lot of experience. He, he'd been in the what, what's known here as Braddock's defeat, which was in Britain a huge, huge deal to have that kind of you know, that size of a defeat overseas. And it was almost accidental. It was just like the timing was bad. And and Braddock was not a real combat officer. Uh, he'd been, you know, more of a somebody who was born into the rank and, and had, you know, kind of honorary, showy generalships. But he wasn't he wasn't totally incompetent. It's just that they they wandered into the woods and they were fighting with the wrong with the wrong tactics. And the French, for once, decided, you know, our only hope is to, to, to do this like the Indians do. And half the French, you know, and Canadians took their shirts off and painted themselves just because they thought we'll be scarier and we'll have a better chance. And, you know, if, if we run away, you know, we have less clothes on, it'll be a little bit easier. So I, I, I think the, you know, the idea of revolution had not really started in, in those colonies yet. There, there were often, this idea of, well, our colony is going to be a country, you know, and, and the, our neighbor colonies will trade with them. You know, so there were, there were very ambitious guys there who really were not, you know, thinking revolution. They were thinking, I've got a little kingdom here. I can tell the amount of research you've done, but how long were you, so since you had the idea from, from Robert Carlyle, were you a little bit of research here, a little bit of there, or do you dedicate yourself to writing this? Is this sort of a lockdown? You know, I I think it took me a year to write. Once I decided to do it, I have a rule that, that, because I've written a couple historical things now, I can do one week of research on a certain topic, and then I have to write for about a week. Research is fun, you know, you you find all that, but it can be a big rabbit hole. And I don't want to lose my momentum on the book. So I'll research a, a specific thing and then I'll write a chapter or two. And then I may know I have to go back and do some some more uh, detailed research on this. I might need to know more about the weapons they had or, or you know, a certain thing. But I'm going to go and, and go into this next chapter. And for that, I need to I, I can read in French. So, so I got some books that were written you know, in the actually in the 1700s by French who had just gotten to Martinique. You know, so I might do that for a week and then I'll come back and I'll write my first couple chapters set in Martinique. But, you know, so it's a back and forth thing. And and then you you start to, to read big sections and you say, OK, I'm a little weak on what happened here and I'm a little weak on what happened there. So so I I feel like. I feel like you could get lost in research. Um, and then you just find incredible things. When when I got to Lovett's trial, there's a transcript of his trial. <laughs> you know, and you can get it on the great uh, scene on uh, Amazon. Book. Yeah. So I, I just lifted a lot of the dialogue from that because it's so incredible. And what you realize, what I realized was that his uh, defense barrister, the guy who's defending him, he spends half his time saying, isn't it great that these people failed, <laughs> you know, and isn't our king wonderful? And, our, you know, I know it was an awful thing, but let's consider, you know, um, he has to do that because, he, you know, as he's told by by the prosecutor, you have to be a little careful how, how you know, uh, fervently you, you know, you, know you, you can't seem to be on this guy's side, even though you're defending him. Um, so did you always have obviously you're going to know a lot more about the process than I will but uh, this was originally a screenplay idea did Mm -hmm. you I mean once once it's and it's a tragedy that it didn't get the funding but once Mm -hmm. it hasn't got the funding is that it it's 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 gone forever 
and then you just have to move on. Unless unless a series of incredible things happen, now it would make a better miniseries, you know, Mm. because it's longer. Um, But uh, you have to be awfully successful to be able to get the amount of money to make a big movie like that would have been. And we just weren't that successful. We never got that hot. And then there's just not that many people making that kind of movie anymore, that big historical kind of movie anymore. Michael Mann got to make, you know, do a remake of uh, The Last of the Mohegans. And that was a you know very well-made movie. Black Robe was a very good movie. There, there's been some movies made, you know, but they were usually by people who made, you know, had had movies that had gone platinum recently. And, and they were saying, OK, you can try this. But there is a real prejudice in Hollywood against doing period movies. They're expensive, you know, and. If it's not a sequel to something, for instance, a good example is Master and Commander, which is those Patrick O'Brien books, which I have read all of and and, and really enjoyed. If that had done better at the box office, they would have brought those people back. You know, they had the boat, they had the costumes, and they used two novels, I think, to stitch that together, but it just didn't make enough money. So it's... um, it gets more likely that I'm, I might be able to make a movie for $2 million than 20. And this would probably, you know, this now would probably cost 50 or something like that. And that's just not going to happen. One thing that I, I think does happen though, is the processes are so different that it doesn't seem like I'm repeating myself when I write a novel out of it. For instance, a very basic thing, which is in the movie, people would speak their language We would have to get people to learn Lenape from tapes and do their dialogue. And then you see subtitles. So the audience would be in on what they were saying, like they're in the book. In the book, you have, I had to come up with strategy of how are we going to absorb all these different languages? And so what I finally came up with, instead of having Indians trying to speak English, which they, at this point, the Lenape really didn't very much. When when he's talking in Lenape with them, it's just very straight dialogue with no quotations. You're you're basically getting subtitles from them that are very simple, and because they they don't sound very smart when they're trying to speak English, and they they tend to sound a little poetic because they had more in their language. They didn't have a lot of abstract terms. So if you're having, you know, contention and difficulty between each other, a tree has fallen across our path, which is very poetic, you know, but it can get to a little italic So I cut down on that. And then the same thing with the amount of untranslated French that I use is I just realized, OK, you know, this is about a woman who nobody is speaking her language around her. She's lost at first. So she's going to be hearing both the lieutenant's French and Creole French from Amelie, how am I going to do that? Well, I'm going to have real French, but usually what I say in English afterward is going to explain what was just said, or it's got, you know, explosif, you know, and works for Spanish or whatever. You use, you know, one of those words that you can kind of say, oh, I, I bet that's the same word we have. So you you really have to rethink how you tell the story. And, and you know, it's it's... That and the fact that when you make a movie, you have all these helpers who have skills that you don't have. When you write a book, it's just you. But at the same time, if you want the sun to shine, the sun is shining, you know, which on a movie set doesn't happen. I mean, because you, you've written so many screenplays, haven't you? Mm-hmm. Uh, it's About it, over 100 now. Yeah. So the process, I guess, it's just more time consuming. Well, obviously, a novel like this is, is 800 or pages, but. Yeah, it is. It is because screenplays, you are you are suggesting things that somebody else is going to fill in later. You are for, there's a there's a wonderful line. I think it's in a, a short story of Raymond Chandler's where the, the detective says he, he gave me a drink of warm gin and a dirty glass. He doesn't describe the office, but you see the from that detail. And that's what you do in a screenplay. You, you might say, you know, this is the, the kind of place where the detective has a bottle of gin and he'll give you a drink and a dirty glass while you're sitting there, you know, telling your tale. And then you don't describe the rest of the, you know, that's a screenplay. You know, in a novel, you got to fill in a, a few more things. 
you, you might, you know, like Dickens, I read a lot of Dickens while I was doing this. You, you might describe their faces. In a movie, their faces, you just point the camera at them. So, so it's, a, it's a very, you know, they're different muscles. And there are people who, who really are very good novelists who wouldn't have an idea of writing a screenplay. And then there are, you know, screenwriters who would be lost writing a, a novel. That's just not the way they think and see the world. And then there are people like Richard Price, who's wonderful in both. He was a wonderful screenplay playwriter. He, I think his, his probably fa- most famous one was Clockers, the book that became a Spike Lee movie. He's just a terrific writer in both forms. It's funny you mention that. I just, I finished reading before I was reading yours, Quentin Tarantino's uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, where uh-huh. you, 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 you get a name check in there. Oh yeah, you know, somebody told me that. Yeah, I haven't yeah. read that. I just read another one of his books, Film Speculation, which is about his growing up and what movies he went to and why and stuff like that. He's a good writer. He, he he's very honest about himself. Yeah, he's certainly watched a lot of um, <laughs> watched a lot. Yeah. Um, I wanted to just because we're we're getting close to the end, and I, I wanted to ask you uh, just a couple of questions on a bit more on filmmaking. What's your view of uh, filmmaking in Hollywood today? Because My impression as a viewer all the way over here in in Britain is that there's a huge amount of this sort of superhero Marvel, which I'm I'm sure they're they're fantastic for people who watch them, but I'm not really into them at all. And it seems like they dominate the Mm -hmm. sort of studio industry. Well, for one thing is, is studios are on their last legs. Most of them have been bought by corporations and are, you know, Warner Brothers is now a big part of a conglomerate. And so the ideas, the market research and the money people are definitely, you know, they're at the wheel. And what they have decided is it's really hard to get people into a theater. And the one thing that they can make that gets people into the theater are continuing stories. So it might be Thor Ragnarok. It might be Spider-Man. It might be Indiana Jones. It might be the dinosaurs, you know, from Jurassic Park. But if we make one of those, we have a kind of guaranteed audience. A certain number of people are going to come. And, you know, so the best work is being done on TV series. Much better in Europe than in the States. but, But still here, the best work is there are some very good series happening here. And they're coming from the streamers. The studios that that survive are just desperate to get. I've seen like five movies since COVID ended in movie theaters, and they've been like screenings. There's 300 seats, and there's five of us there, and it's it's you know Avatar. You know it's it's really you know hard to to get people back into the theaters once they're gone, and so they're just saying, "Who's our audience? We'll go into theaters." There are these fans of these these series, you know, that, that they know what they're going to get. It's another, you know, Mission Impossible with Tom Cruise, or we're going to, you know, we're going to do a sequel to Top Gun. You know, it's a, it's a proven commodity. Whereas something new, a new drama, who knows, it could be the best drama in the world and we can't get people in. So the economics have always driven in it. We were lucky in that in the, in the time that we were trying to make movies, there was this little ecosystem off Hollywood independent theaters that needed products, you know, and certainly people like, you know, Mike Lee's movies came over here and, you know, good stuff from Australia and good stuff from France. And, you know, the 2% of Americans who are willing to read subtitles went to the, you know, subtitled movies in those theaters. So it's, it's just, it's always changed. It changed when, you know, silent movies turned into talkies It changed in the fifties when television showed up. And this is just, you know, people are trying to navigate this thing and standalone features are the hardest thing to get made if they're not tied to something that has gone before and proven to make money. You've made some great, great movies too. Thank too, you. I think Oscar nominated uh, Passion Fish, Lone Star. Do you think you could, uh, Lone Star, if you put that to uh, get funding today, do you think you could get that through? You know, uh, it's really hard for me. I'm just not on the list right now, you know. Oh, is um, it so, like that there then? Yeah, you know, some of that's just age and some of that's track record that I have never made in the last 20 years anybody any money. You know, things have, might have done well, but not, you know, if you make $2 million for people, they're not interested in Hollywood. You know, that, that's, they're there to make 
20 million to 100 million dollars that's make in profit yeah that's that's what they're trying to do you know two million dollars as well that you know we could put it in the bank you know and the interest would be two million dollars so what have we wasted our time on so you know that that with me as a director you couldn't somebody else might be able to you know a, a director who had just had a hit could take that very screenplay and get it made they probably would have to cast it differently you know, Chris Cooper probably wouldn't be the lead. Somebody who had been had a big hit recently would be the lead. So we were very lucky. You know, we 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 just kind of sometimes we got independent funding. Twice I worked with a studio, and once it was terrible, and once it was fine. But that that was a different time. I was I was doing a little bit of research, and I ended up down a, a rabbit hole and on YouTube. And there's a I learned that perhaps you were writing a screenplay for Jurassic Park Four. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, that was fun. I had I had worked when I first started coming out to Hollywood and, and, and working for the movies for Steven Spielberg on another screenplay that never got made. And then they brought me in and the, they, they had made three of the Jurassic Park movies. And the second one was kind of King Kong. And the third one was kind of, uh, how, why would anybody go back to an island where dinosaurs eat, you know? And so the, the, the plot, you know, was a little forced even though the, the the dinosaur work was great and the chases were good and everything. And so they were, they were thinking about what can we do that's different? And so I was brought in to try to help them find a different way to, you know, let's, you know, maybe put some human genes into the dinosaurs and what would, what, why would they want to do that? And what would they want them to do as kind of a, a strike force? I think my idea was that they were going to eventually use them to uh, velociraptors to protect the pipeline from terrorists. You know, you'd think twice if you knew there were velociraptors out there. And finally, I think what happened is they just weren't quite, oh, they're expensive movies. I don't know if we're going to go with this. And then they, I think they realized, oh, there's there's a whole audience that we haven't gone back to the island for like 12 or 14 years. You know, we could just make another one where they go back to the island, which they did. And it was you know, well made, but I don't think it, it didn't have enough of my stuff in it for me to feel like I could, you know, I wanted to ask for, for any screen credit, you know, which is I have I have to say when I've worked on movies that other writers worked on, I have asked not to be included more than I have asked to be included. Well, I won't ask which ones uh, those yeah. are, but the, I really, I really do hope someone picks up this this novel and makes it into a, a TV series. It would be, it would be fantastic and epic. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's they just have to spend the money, and and from the Outlander series, the, the costumes are in a in a you know wardrobe somewhere. Yeah, they could use some of those. I suppose but Carlisle's it, a bit old now, isn't he? To, for for this particular for Jamie. guy, he would be in it, but you know, I I I I'd like to get him involved somewhere because he the old fox. It's so much fun to imagine traveling around the Highlands of Scotland with Robert Carlyle to knock on doors with you. That must have been incredible. Yes. Yeah, it was really fun. Huge fan of his. Well, well, it's been fantastic, John. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this pod, can I ask you a favour that will really help me out? Could you tell any friends who'd be interested and even go into their podcast app on their phone? You don't need to wrestle them to the floor for this and bring the show up to subscribe. This will really help me to grow the pod and get more great guests and more shows. I've got plenty more fascinating history coming up, including the aftermath of Alexander the Great's death, World War I and Walking the Western Front Way, And of course, our film club continues this month with Ben Affleck's Argo. I do hope you can join me. Thank you and good night.